With that, I think we will dive in. I'll say a few of my remarks again for those who have joined us late. Um, this is the ERA uh, monthly government affairs committee meeting, and this month we will be spending most of our time together doing our um, our quarterly update of consumer protection developments uh, relevant to ERA members, including FTC, state AG, class actions, um, and ERSC developments, um, as well as um, as well as some Lanham Act developments as well. And uh, this call will be recorded um, for that reason and for the comfort of others. Um, I ask that people participating in the call put their phone on mute. Um, and then we will, there will be time for question and answer at the, at the end. We will not record those uh, questions. So you don't need to be concerned about you being, um, you being on the ERA blog. We will post on the ERA blog and website the audio of just the substantive portion of the program um, as well as the WebEx materials. And if you're called in but not dialed in through WebEx, I encourage you if you're at a screen to, to go through WebEx so you can follow along um, with the PowerPoint presentation that our team has prepared. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to um, some folks on um, my team who have worked really hard to pull this together for you. Um, and some of these folks you know and some of these folks you don't. Um, Chris Crook and Shaheen Rothermel are associates in Venable's advertising law practice and uh, have taken the laboring oar to pull the information together. Um, Chris and Shaheen um, are active participants in the Women Affairs Committee and attend our in-person meetings, um, so it should be known to, to most of you. Um, but we were really excited because there's a lot of information we needed to pull together. Um, and it takes a village for this, and we have um, a fantastic group of summer associates. They're um, second-year law students who are with us for the summer um, um, who helped us pull together the information, and um, we'll be presenting some of it to you today as well. Uh, and that is Catherine Deering, Kristen Elms, and Meryl Nolan. Um, we're very happy to, to uh, have you with the ERA family. We wish we could bring them all to Vegas with us, but they'll unfortunately be back uh, in law school at that time. Um, but so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shaheen to begin um, the update. I'm going to start by talking about the federal developments with the Federal Trade Commission and go through this quarter's regulatory action by the FTC. Um, the first case is uh, um, a who was charged with violating the FTC Act and the mail order rule, which requires sellers to ship products within either the advertised time frame or within 30 days. The FTC, this defendant had advertised gold and silver as safe retirement investments at discounted prices. And the defendants allegedly required customers to pay up front, either with a check or a wire. And despite advertising that the items would ship within two to four weeks or that they would ship soon, sometimes never delivered the order. Which many of you probably know about is the Amazon case. Um, this, this is a uh, federal judge that granted the FTC's request for a judgment in a case that the FTC brought uh, Amazon's in-app purchases. Uh, so Amazon bills customers for unauthorized charges for the FTC. Uh, the FTC said that the disclosures about those in-app charges uh, with apps that were advertised as free were not adequate. So according to the FTC, you had parents who, you know, were seeing charges on their cell phone bills when their parents when their children were playing apps that the parents thought were free. Um, the court uh, did two things that are notable in this case. Um, despite um, fighting for the FTC on some of the charges, the court, number one, rejected the commission's request for a permanent injunction, which is pretty huge for those of you who are aware that the FTC normally imposes a 20-year injunction on defendants, and it gives the FTC broad oversight into a lot of companies, both big and small. Um, and the other big uh, thing that's notable about this case was that the judge also called into question the amount of um, money that FTC was, um, was seeking from Amazon. So it'll be interesting to see um, what happens in the future with these types of issues with, um, with monetary relief as well as or not companies are going to start challenging injunctions. Okay. 
formulas is um, the FTC had a proposed stipulated final order that would ban um, makers of dietary supplements from um, advertising or selling those supplements on um, <laughs> material facts of their refund and cancellation policy. Um, in this case, this is an example of ne um, negative option in Roska and the FTC taking action in that. The um, companies agreed to settle charges surrounding um, all natural claims for their skincare products. Um, the complaint alleged that they had advertised their product is all natural, 100% natural, um, despite any synthetic ingredients. That we've included on here is Lord and Taylor, although it didn't happen this quarter. Um, we thought this was notable um, in that it was an issue with social influencers and native advertising, where Lord and Taylor had a campaign where 30 influencers wore the same dress on the same day, and FTC. Uh, said that Lord and Taylor didn't adequately disclose that, and earlier this year the um, the FTC approved a final consent order with Lord and Taylor based on um, based on its in its disclosures. Next, we have uh, Lutein and Viatech, which have settled charges that they had made deceptive claims for their Mosquito Shield brand. Um, according to the FTC, uh, the company had made claims that the wristbands would prevent users from being bitten by mosquitoes in, I believe, a method that would provide some sort of barrier around the person that would prevent those bites from coming through. Next is um, a, a pretty big decision um, for development in FTC. It was first jury verdict um, with the FTC concerning not call violations under the telemarketing sales rule. In that case, a jury found defendants liable for um, violations of the TSR. And um, I'm going to talk about this one for a little bit because it's so important. No jury trials are not available in FTC cases because the FTC files for equitable relief um, under the FTC Act. But here, um, the FTC sought civil penalties and they had a right to trial, not injunction. And in that case, the defendants uh, sold family films and fundraising for certain charities. The FTC's complaint alleged that defendants had made deceptive claims about how much of the donor's money actually went to charities and um, had made other violations of the TSR, such as calling um, 9 million people who were on the, DN the Do Not Call Registry, calling 185,000 Consumers who'd requested not to be called again. Um, almost 8 million people without transmitting caller ID information, um, as well as other calls such as not making um, oral disclosures as required and abandoning the calls. Um, now the jury verdict has, has come against um, the company. It's going up to the court to determine the proper amount of civil penalty. That came out very recently is Warner Brothers. In this case, the FTC had alleged that Warner Brothers had deceived consumers by paying social influencers online to book videos of gameplay with um, the Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor video game. And what had happened was that the influencers had then posted videos on YouTube and other social media without disclosing that Warner had actually paid the influencers or that the um, Warner Brothers had given them a free advanced release version of the game and told them how to pr promote it. In this case, the FTC alleged that um, Warner Brothers not, did not allow influencers to clearly and conspicuously disclose that connection, that payment between FTC on the one hand and the influencers on the other hand. And in fact, the FTC told the influencers, or the FTC alleged that Warner Brothers told the influencers to disclose below the fold. Now, as the settlement, Warner Brothers or failing to make disclosures that content is sponsored or misrepresenting that reviews and gameplay videos are objective, independent video, um, opinions of enthusiasts. Um, now take steps to educate its sponsor, um, influencers to um, properly disclose the connection between Warner Brothers and those influencers. 
Next is um, a case against a Florida-based affiliate marketer that um, allegedly used illegal spam e uh, emails when selling weight loss products and allegedly used false celebrity endorsements. The um, complaint alleges that the defendants paid affiliate marketers a commission for the emails out that linked content to quote, quote fake news websites and also false testimonials, including using Oprah Winfrey's likeness. Next is um, the FTC versus American Handicapped and Disadvantaged Workers. Um, defendants in that case settled charges that they had tricked consumers um, into buying products based on representations that the telemarketers themselves were either people with disabilities or that money that the consumers were paying to the defendants would go people with disabilities. In that case, the FTC had alleged that the defendants had charged exorbitant prices for normal physical um, goods. So you can see on the slide, for an example, the FTC made was $30 for two light bulbs. The case is um, Practice Fusion, which is um, an electronic health record company that uh, agreed to settle FTC's charges associated with its review website. Um, in, that, in that case, the FTC alleged that the defendant had solicited reviews from consumers by sending them emails and that emails appear to be from the consumer's doctor and ask the consumer to review his or her experience with that doctor. And those reviews were used to populate a review website um, by the defendant. The property in the FTC was that the defendant used um, users' personal information um, to populate that website. And some of the surveys that were made public included people's full name, co contact information, and personal health problems. Um, one example by the FTC was a user whose name was used said that she had a yeast infection and another user who was asking about the proper dosage of her Xanax. The next click media. Um, this, this goes to show the risk of using um, certifications and seals on your websites. We know the FTC is based on that. In this case, the FTC filed a complaint alleging that a company, defendant company, marketed a certification program, which was quote unquote doctor trusted, to 800 websites or 800 sellers of um, dietary supplements. What that seal apparently did, or what the seal was supposed to represent to consumers, was that doctors had actually review the information on the websites, on the dietary supplement websites, and had basically put a seal of approval on it. Like all the claims on this website are okay, I reviewed it. I'm doctor, um, you can trust this website. So the final order would, would per, um, prohibit the misrepresentation of medical expertise, expertise used to evaluate that product, um, as well as a, um, a good judgment. Next, a location tracking program that um, it, sorry, in Moby settled allegations that it had tracked hundreds of millions of consumers. Um, using geolocation uh, technology in the phone, just consumers request not to be tracked, and by not having asked for um, consent before tracking them. Um, Court FTC in Mobi misrepresented that advertising software would not track consumers if they opted out, when in reality they did anyway. Um, and according to the FTC, that advertising network has reached over 1 billion devices worldwide. The but the FTC and in Moby calls for a judgment of $4 million. Um, so this it, it, um, requires in Moby to adopt a new privacy program that would obtain affirmative express consent. Um, words right now. Okay, so the next case is um, in the matter of very incognito technology. And this was a case where um, another company, VipVape, had uh, misrepresented its privacy practices, but in this case, they had deceived consumers about its participation in the APEX cross-border privacy rules by putting um, uh, representations on its website that it was a member of that, that, um, that cross-border privacy group. In fact, it was not cert certified to participate in. The last slide I have on FTC, and this is a pretty big one for all of us, and this means that um, what's happening here is the FTC is increasing the penalty. It's up from $16,000 for the maximum civil penalty to $40,000 for violations of 16 law provisions, including Section 5, as well as others like the Clayton Act. 
However, that increased penalty is um, going to go in place on August 1st this year, but it's only going to uh, function prospectively, not retroactively. And um, of course, the court's still going to take into consideration um, story criteria that you need to account for when it's determining civil um, penalties, including degree of culpability, prior conduct, ability to pay, and the effect of the penalty on the ability to continue to do business. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Catherine, to talk about the attorneys general. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Shaheen said, this section covers dates on actions taken or statements made by state attorneys general recently. Uh, the first case discussed is in the matter of Walgreens. New York Attorney General Schneiderman announced a settlement with Walgreens for allegedly overcharging consumers and using misleading advertisements. The use of inducing consumers to purchase products by doing the following, according to an undercover investigation. Charging consumers a different price at the register than the price published in print advertisements and on store shelf tags, calling a product a smart buy when the advertised price is the same as the original retail price. Labeling a product clearance, implying that the product will be available at a reduced price for a limited time when it might be available for as long as 8 to 10 months further than what was stated, and buying customers will receive an immediate cash discount that actually applies to a future purchase. Walco allegedly failed to provide consumers with a clear and consistent, with clear and consistent information concerning its loyalty incentive program, which is known as Bounce Rewards Points. Well, to pay $500,000 in penalties, fees, and costs, and to reform its advertising practices. Our case is in the business opportunity realm. According to the Arizona Attorney General, Advanced Social Media LLC agreed to shut itself down following consumer fraud investigation into allegations of false advertising. Allegations were that Advanced mailed out false advertisements claiming consumers were eligible to receive thousands of dollars in grant funding and that their chances of receiving it would increase dramatically if purchased this company's grant funding training. They also allegedly sold social media advertising to consumers, claiming thousands would see the ads. The attorney claims that Advance misrepresented both its reach in social media and the nature of its training program. Advance submitted an assurance of discontinuance and agreed to cease operations and terminate as an Arizona LLC. This is indicative of business opportunity enforcement as a focus for state attorneyship. General. Back in New York is an ongoing suit against a man who has been in the news once or twice lately, Mr. Donald Trump and the entity known as Trump University. Attorney General Schneiderman went after Mr. Trump on Good Morning America recently. Among other things, Mr. Schneiderman alleges that Trump potentially made up to $5 million through Trump University. One of the nominate responses by Trump to this is that Schneiderman is driven by political motives in terms of the timing and direction of the suit because it's on the Hillary for New York Leadership Council. An interesting point about the matter, when Schneiderman was asked whether Trump could still be called to testify as sitting president, Schneiderman said, quote, sure, he doesn't have immunity from civil fraud trials. So it's the groundwork, excuse me, for interesting future questions if Trump were to become president and the suit were to continue. Another example of the state attorneys general going after companies allegedly targeting seniors. A company called Your Magazine Service was accused of falsely telling people to send money based on their pre-existing account with the magazine. A magazine Service was able to provide specific personal information about the people they allegedly contacted. The general alleges another magazine company sold the personal information of that magazine and subscribers to them, such as days and addresses. So, um, Your Magazine Service was able to provide accurate personal information when asking for payments on these subscriptions. Six of the individuals receiving these materials were 68 years old or older, reflecting, as I said, a focus on the protection of seniors as a focus of the state attorney general. The last matter under discussion related to recent developments at the CFPB. The CFPB recently released a potential rulemaking that strictly regulates the payday loan industry and similar setups. I saw Attorney General Rutledge met with CFPB Director Cordray to push for a conference of states to discuss this rulemaking because such a conference is the right thing to do any time a federal rule is going to supplant the reasonable policy choices of either Arkansas or other states. About a ago, the Attorney General also published a letter requesting a state conference because the potential rule would, quote, conflict with, constrict, and otherwise unnecessarily interfere with existing state consumer protection laws. This example of states wanting to regulate industry and potentially conflict issues between state and federal enforcement. 
The rule creates unified standards but removes state power to regulate the industry. We see how much the CFPB ends up working with states on this regulation. And I'll turn it over to Kristen Adams to discuss the developments in the ERSP. Thank you, Catherine. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, we have Ideal Living, which offered its back bubble product uh, primarily through broadcasts on their website. The product is effectively a cushion inner tube of air which hangs from your ceiling. And you place the tube around the midsection and then hang within the tube to decompress your spine. In their advertisements, they use claims regarding pain relief, like relieve your pain in seconds guaranteed, stop back pain for life, and immediately decompress your spine. Uh, as well as comparative exclusivity claims like relieve back pain more quickly. Another claim. I first found that there was a reasonable basis for claims touting temporary pain relief. But the more interesting component of this may actually relate to the studies that Ideal Living used to support their claims. Now, one study used 20 participants for two to five minutes of product use. A study used only 11 participants at two minutes of product usage. And this was found to be sufficient scientific backing when offered in conjunction with substantial volumes of more non-product specific studies on the gravitational spinal traction technology, which is the general technology that the back bubble utilizes. Also, it supports the idea that pain relief happens quickly with the product, uh, but the claim in seconds was determined to be a bit of an overstatement. Uh, so if your advertisement provides a very specific time period in which the consumers may expect performance results, you will need appropriately supporting studies regarding the literal time frame in your advertisement. I'll note here, claims using the terms proven results uh, could reasonably be construed by consumers to mean clinically proven results. Living voluntarily changed their claim to medically proven technology so to avoid the implication that the back bubble specifically is clinically proven. The second case we have here is Puritan's Pride. What we're learning here is that studies reporting on the ingredients of a product and not the product itself to test the same ingredient dosage, formulation, and method of administration as the holistic product would use. Puritan offers a dietary supplement with caffeine and other ingredients, which claims to increase attention and focus. And its studies which demonstrated the efficacy of individual ingredients at increasing focus, a rather than studies of the active mind product holistically. Ingredients tested were studied also at a different dosage level than the ingredients appear in the active mind product. And the claims were unsubstantiated and are to be discontinued. Likewise, the speed claims of the products working within 60 minutes should have continued because the studies were designed to identify, were not specifically to identify when the pill would take effect, even though the studies did measure the pill's effectiveness at 20, 30, 60, and 70 minute intervals. Moving on to today's care updates, it's Jack specific. I think this product is a starter 3D printer for children. You put in Jacks and the machine outputs little figurines. A uh, broadcast advertisement shows the fingers inserting wax into machine, and Kara questioned whether the advertisement implied that children should use the product without adult supervision. After confirming that the hands in the video were not those of a children, that uh, there was the absence of children in the spot, and Jack confirmation that the heating element can only be accessed if the machine is unscrewed and wholly dismantled, Kara determined that the commercial actually did not pose the dangers it originally thought, and it closed the case. The way from this next case is that advertisers should demonstrate the performance or use of a product in the way it was intend its intended audience of children would actually use that product. Now, the tier is aqua beads, which are small beads that you arrange into a pattern such as a blit or a small animal, and should then spray the beads with water. And why the beads are diffused to get into the design you created. Sarah was concerned first that the kit came with enough supplies to make all 20 of the design shown, which it did. And secondly, that the advertising curl and product packaging accurately depicted how long the product needs to dry before it can be used. A could stem from a commercial depicting a child spraying her creation with water and then immediately picking it up to play with it. Whereas the kit's instructions may require up to an hour for the, the artwork to dry. The pen also says to spray with water and the beads will, quote, magically stick together. Uh, CARE's recommendation to future advertising will now clearly convey that it takes up to an hour for the product to dry before use. We have cloud pets by Spiral Toys. Clouds are stuffed animals that can actually receive text messages and they would read them aloud to the children. Uh, CARE questioned whether it was clear that batteries are not included and 
where the apps the toys use could have an age gate prior to collecting personal information. Now, Caro did require a disclosure that called out batteries are required. Since any item essential to the product's use at purchase must be disclosed. Now, we're going to age gate. The company argued the stuffed animal was not targeted at children, and Caro found that while it is directed at children, children are really not its primary audience, as parents and other adults would use the app to set up the toy. Now, the app could permissibly age screen uh, to confirm whether notice and consent requirements are necessary for the online services offered the application. This concludes our ERSP and CARIO section for today, and Meryl Nolan will now walk you through the most recent class action updates. Hello, everyone. For class actions, we start off with Portfolio Recovery Associates, or PRA. In April, PRA said that it will pay $18 million to resolve multi-district litigation, accusing the debt collection company of violating the Telephone Consumer Protection Act by auto-dialed calls to consumers without their consent. In a motion seeking preliminary approval of the settlement, PR said they plan to send settlement notices to approximately 7.4 million consumers who received an auto-dialed call to their cell phone from November 2006 to July 2013. Is that in January 2014, the judge declined to dismiss the multi-district litigation, saying parent company PRA could be held vicariously liable for TCPA violations despite not having placed the calls itself. Next, we have Mednick v. Precor, in which an Illinois federal judge denied class certification to a group of people suing Precor over the allegedly defective heart rate readings of its workout machines, they failed the predominance requirements for federal class certification. Gary Mednick said that Precor charged him a premium price for high-end workout machines that included a heart rate monitor in the hand grips. But his monitor didn't work, and he says the company knew it didn't. He brought suit in 2014. Mednick says he called Precor's customer service and was transferred to a few different people before being told it was a known problem with his model and that he should buy a polar heart rate monitor costing 160 out of pocket. The judge denied the plaintiff's motion for class certification, saying an expert opinion showing that, quote, moon artifacts left by the movement of exercisers' hands on the hand grip hadn't been shown to be a problem that troubled every buyer of the machine. Next, we have Sun Products out of the Southern District of New York. It's a fairly standard Slackville case. As you are likely familiar, Slackville claims center on a product packaging which isn't filled to its full capacity. With it. So it's like when you open a bag of potato chips and there's a lot of air and not so many chips. Except in this case, it's laundry detergent, brands like Whisk, All, and Snuggle. The plaintiff alleged she thought she was buying the value or economy sizes of detergent from big bulk retailers like Costco because containers were so large. But when you factor in that there was allegedly 17% of empty space in the bottle, the price per ounce actually works out to be more in line with the premium price detergent instead of the lower price prints consumers would expect from larger bottles, particularly at bulk retailers. The plaintiff alleges there wasn't a practical reason for the extra space and thus the packaging would be false, misleading, or deceptive. At point, the plaintiff hasn't specified damages, but it's worth keeping an eye on this one where it nests out. Our next case concerns Whirlpool. A California judge preliminarily approved a settlement between Whirlpool and a class of about 5,000 in-state consumers who alleged that two models of the KitchenAid refrigerators aren't as energy efficient as advertised. Settlement approval draws to a close of four-year legal battle spurred by a Department of Energy investigation in 2011. The DOE tested the KitchenAid appliances and found that they did not meet federal standards. Throughout the legal proceedings and in its dealings with the DOE, Whirlpool maintained that it had not intentionally misled consumers. Rather, the company stated that the refrigerators had passed its own internal tests. The original complaint filed in January 2012 sought to represent a nationwide class of consumers. In April 2015, Judge Nunley rejected the plaintiff's request to certify a class of consumers from 32 states and the District of Columbia, but granted certification to a subclass of California customers. The agent offers a 10% rebate or $55 in cash per appliance to a class of California consumers who allege that two models in particular of refrigerators were mislabeled with the federal government's Energy Star logo. Next up, we have a Pepsi case. 
A California judge granted preliminary approval of a settlement and a class action alleging Pepsi soft drinks contained elevated levels of a potential carcinogen. The settlement required Pepsi to monitor levels of caramel coloring in its products. The 2014 complaint accused the soda maker of failing to warn consumers that Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, and Pepsi One soft drinks contained elevated levels of 4-mel, a compound formed during the manufacturing of caramel coloring that is recognized by California as a cancer-causing chemical. This follows on the heels of tests, test results published by Consumer Reports in January 2014 it found Pepsi's product contained amounts of 4-mel in excess of the allowed 29 micrograms allowed for can or bottle, posing risks to consumers. This argued Pepsi's use of 4-mel violated California consumer protection statutes and common law. Pepsi agreed to the same settlement in another lawsuit in California State Court, Environmental House v. Pepsi Beverages, settled in 2015. Settlement expands the geographic scope of the requirements for formal levels from California to nationwide. Aside from the facts of the case itself, it'll be interesting to see how the consumer report study is presented as the case evolves, especially relating to any evidentiary issues which might crop up. Our next case involves Sirius XM Radio. Sued to pay $35 million to settle proposed class actions alleging the company illegal, illegally used predictive dialers for telemarketing calls. The proposed settlement was filed in the case of plaintiff Francis Hooker, who, allerg who alleges in his 2014 complaint that after purchasing a 2012 Hyundai Elantra that came with a free trial of Sirius Radio, the company violated the TCPA by causing third parties to call his cell phone through use of an automatic phone dialing system and also after 9 p.m. Eastern Time to market a paid subscription. The proposed deal, which extends to three related cases across the country, Sirius will pay $35 million in a cash common fund for which proposed class members can either draw a payment or opt to receive three months of Sirius XM Select service at no charge. The company has also agreed to enter into agreements with certain telemarketing call center, vendor, call center vendors to make modifications to their system architecture. The deal didn't end to a 2013 TCPA suit that produced one proposed offer of judgment to the named plaintiff. In September, Sirius XM offered Hooker $10,521, which it said was more than the $10,500 maximum he could recover under the TCPA for his individual claims. Hooker however, rejected the offer, seeking a resolution that would benefit the entire proposed class. Next, we have a Revlon case. Revlon recently asked a New York federal judge to sign off on a $900,000 deal in a proposed class action alleging that the company misled consumers into thinking its DNA-advantaged product line could actually alter skin cells' genetic code. The plaintiff filed suit in 2014 contending that Revlon products labeled age-defying with DNA advantage basically just contain sunscreen. A quick complaint, Revlon's use of the phrase with the advantage rather than with sunscreen, likely to, likely to deceive ordinary consumers into thinking that there is something particularly scientifically important and beneficial about these products, rather than merely providing protection from UVA rays. Other claims that even if the company is referring to other ingredients when making the DNA advantage claim, no ingredient identified by its customer service employees is capable of stimulating, interacting with, or otherwise affecting the DNA in human skin cells, as Revlon's advertising suggests. Under the deal, consumers will receive $3 per purchase, capped at three claims for those without a receipt, which out to about three times the price premium for the DNA Advantage products. Revlon also said that it will discontinue the DNA Advantage Foundation concealer and powder by the end of 2017. Our case covers seventh generation, which has agreed to pay $4.5 million to settle a class action in New York federal court that claimed it deceptively labeled its cleaning products as natural, even if it contained synthetic preservatives. The consumer said in the November 2014 suit that the company incorrectly used the term natural, despite the fact that two of the ingredients are synthetic antimicrobial preservatives. The question were various laundry detergents and dish, dish soaps that were available for sale at places like Walgreens, Walmart, Target, Amazon, Bath 
beyond in Whole Foods. Consumers who have proof of purchase can get a full refund on purchases. Without proof of purchase can get 50%. Seventh duration has also to remove claims of 100% natural and all natural from the label and also clarify claims about hypoallergenic and non-toxic properties. On the seventh generation website, the company will disclose that statements about the hypoallergenic or non-toxic properties don't mean that a product won't cause an aller allergic reaction or irritation in any person. And we hand it off to Chris Crook, who's going to cover NAD development. Great. Thanks, Mel. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Chris Crook. I'm a senior associate in Venables Advertising Litigation Practice. Uh, since we've last met, NAD has been extremely busy, and there are a number of cases that I have to go through with you today. I will try to get through as many as uh, possible, time permitting, but for those that I can't get to, uh, they should be in the materials that we've provided. Uh, we have pretty every type of case that NAD, uh, or decision that NAD will, uh, will render, uh, competitor challenge, NAD monitoring, compliance reports, and even an FTC referral. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into the first case, which is uh, Rec at Benkheiser case. This was a challenge brought by Procter and Gamble, and uh, a compliance report based on that challenge. The unclaimed claim that the NAD evaluated was that a, a uh, detergent that was a best buy for three years in a row. Well, Procter and Gamble argued that that the consumer would reasonably take away from that uh, statement that uh, it was the previous three years, uh, when in fact the data to substantiate that claim was from uh, 2011, 12, and 13. Uh, uh, Reckitt agreed to withdraw that particular claim, and NAD treated that as if um, it had amended that the claim be discontinued for, for compliance purposes. Um, so, and Reckitt did, did voluntarily phase out the ad and uh, it was to be in compliance. The next case is the Applegate insulation case. This dealt with a uh, cellulose type of insulation and uh, comparative claims were made to fiberglass. So there were various energy savings claims and uh, some toxicity claims. Uh, starting with the energy savings claims, uh, as you expect, there were uh, percentage comparisons as to whether uh, the cellulose was more effective effective fiberglass somewhere in the range of 20 to 50 percent. Uh, there was also uh, value type claims you'll save money using this type of insulation. And NAD took the opportunity to tell advertisers that when you're making these types of comparative performance claims, the gold standard for substantiation is head-to-head -head studies of the exact products. Now, unfortunately for Applegate, they didn't have the head-to-head -head studies that NAD was looking for. They had studies of similar products uh, that weren't actually the same type of head-to-head -head, uh, products that, that you'd expect. And all of these studies were about 25 to 30 years old. Uh, when, when, when NAD realized that, they, they took the opportunity again to say it's, it's the advertiser's burden to monitor the yard in the market. And here, the studies that were provided to support the, uh, the energy savings claims uh, didn't fit the claim that was being made. Interestingly, the NAD also made another point uh, when it was uh, discussing the substantiation. And in this point, it looked to the, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy that said insulation effectiveness varies greatly over eight different climate zones. And there was no evidence to show that cellulose insulation performed similarly across these different climate zones. So it's a, it's a uh, word of caution to those of you that either make products that could perform differently across various climate zones or, or that are advising clients about the same thing, that you, you need to take that into account when developing your substantiation for advertising claims. Uh, and Moving to the next claim, uh, there was a non-toxic claim that the, the insulation was six times less toxic to humans uh, compared to table salt, and NAD found that the substantiation for this claim didn't necessarily fit the claim, and that's a theme that you're going to see throughout these cases that we're going to discuss. Uh, in this particular instance, the testing that was provided was on uh, the element boron that used in the 
the, the installation, but in commercial capacity. So uh, it, it measured people's exposure to boron who are actually either mining for it or using it in a uh, chemical uh, facility. Last claim that's worth noting here is a, uh, a, a demonstration that was made in the advertising about acoustical performance, so which insulation keeps your room more quiet. Uh, the, the demonstration took an alarm, put it in a bucket, measured the noise, then wrapped the bucket in insulation, measured the noise, and, and made uh, noise canceling claims based on that. The NAD said the demo wasn't a uh, reflection of how the product was actually used and recommended that the claim be changed. Next case we have is an NARB decision uh, for Verizon Communications. And you might recall uh, a while back, Verizon was making claims based on its internet speed and HD quality picture, uh, the, the ability to provide superior performance of those two things. Con challenged, and NAD said that those claims should be amended to make clear that Verizon's uh, superiority claims are based on consumer preference. It was based on consumer service. So Verizon went back, amended the, the advertising to add language to that effect, and launched the advertising. Well, Comcast challenged again, and NAD found that a reasonable takeaway from Verizon's advertising claims is that uh, it's, the, the claims are based on a measurable performance test, not necessarily consumer preference. Up to the NARB, uh, as Verizon appealed, and the ARB even recognized that Verizon, in good faith, was trying to implement the suggestions of NAD, nonetheless found that a reasonable takeaway of the advertising was a substantiated superiority claim. That's the important thing. The ARB took it one step further and said consumer survey results should not be used to support superiority claims with respect to measurable performance. This is a, it's a good thing to keep in the back of your mind when developing substantiation for measurable performance claims. This case is American Dryer, and this case is a compliance report off a challenge brought by Kimberly Clark, and it had to do with jar hand dryers uh, and antimicrobial claims, so kills germs, independently proven to kill certain germs, and he had, had recommended that these claims be changed, and on, in the compliance challenge, American Dryer was able to show that it had begun to remove these claims, but the important thing to keep in mind is the effort that they that that they were able to to show was uh, taking things off the website and, and different uh, sorts of advertisements that they had circulated. But four months after the decision, there were still advertising in the market, uh, which is some cause for concern. But here they were still able to make that showing. So uh, NAD said that they were in compliance. The next case is Vogue International, and again, this is another compliance report that had to do with um, uh, ingredients for a hair care product. Basically, the underlying claim was if you add ingredient A plus B, you get benefit uh, B. Um, NAD had recommended that, that uh, the claim be changed. Vogue International came in on the compliance challenge, showed that it had made changes to the website and the product packaging. But the event from Procter & Gamble was there's still a lot of old packaging out there. The advertisement is still prevalent. But NAD found that Vogue was in compliance because it had made changes to the website, had not ordered any product packaging with old advertising after the decision, and in fact had made the change to new product packaging. The next case is Advanced Nutritional Innovations. And I won't get into a lot of detail in this case. It, it dealt with a lot of health claims. Uh, all of which were found to be unsubstantiated, I think, with the exception of one that others just described how, how a natural process worked. Uh, but the important thing to take away from here is NAD, uh, in this case, reaffirmed the fact that if you're going to make health claims, you need to have clinical trials, and claims coming out of those clinical trials need to be narrowly tailored to fit the evidence. And after you have all that together, you need to make sure that what you're claiming doesn't run afoul of a large body of science that's already in the market. In this particular case, some of the claims that were being made uh, were, in fact, contrary to a number of studies that were already in the market, 
and was another ground which the NAD uh, recommended that the advertising be changed. All right, so the next case is a Procter & Gamble case. The challenger was Kimberly Clark, uh, and this dealt with toilet paper. Uh, it was uh, four times less uh, use, or I'm sorry, uh, Charmin Ultra users are up to four times less use, four times less toilet paper than the leading bargain brand, which is Kimberly Clark Scott. Charmin Ultra Mega Rolls last longer than Scott's 1000, and purchasing Charmin will save consumers money and is a better value. So with the up to claim, the up to four times, the NED started exactly where you would think the NED would start. And that was, do an appreciable number of consumers hit the upper limit of the claim being made? Now, Kimberly Clark had an interesting approach in that they submitted consumer survey evidence to try to raise that bar a little bit. So rather than just an appreciable number, the evidence Kimberly Clark supplied showed that people would expect to hit that four times number, not just an appreciable number to the extent it's somewhere less than most. The NAD evaluated this and, and survey found that 19% of, of consumers were confused by the four times claim. Well, NAD said that while there's no hard and fast rule of a percentage of confusion that needs to be, re uh, that's required to be hit in these types of surveys, it did hit the 20% threshold that is usually the mark for confusion. So while NAD says that there's no hard and fast rule, the surround 19% and they denied it because it didn't hit 20. So it should give you a good idea of, of at least where you need to hit it when you're putting these, these sorts of surveys together. Now, uh, Procter and Gamble did provide two utility studies for the four times claim uh, that was able to substantiate the claim. Kimberly Clark put in its own uh, utility study after the burden flip, but unfortunately, that utility study was on uh, the wrong roll of toilet paper, which uh, actually happened to Procter & Gamble on the next two claims. The more goes per roll in the value claim, Procter & Gamble can be utility study on the wrong toilet paper for those two, and the challenger was able to show that those differences were material. Those two claims were found to be, uh, or, or, or needed to be changed, or recommended to be changed. So uh, make sure that when you're when you're putting the evidence together, that, that you're you're measuring the the correct the correct thing that's being claimed. Right, so the next case, Alcon Laboratories. Seems that contact lenses have been a popular pop product at the NAD over the last couple of months. Uh, this particular uh, case is a compliance action. And it was for superiority claims that relates to uh, deposits on on uh, contact lenses. The there is a the plasma surface, a unique plasma surface technology that was being touted in the advertising by Alcon that limited the amount of deposits on the the um, the contact lenses. Now, what's happening here is Johnson and Johnson. And, and bring compliance challenge brought up a demonstration that was not originally before NAD, but as Johnson & Johnson argued, was uh, ran afoul of the logic in, in the NAD's decision should similarly be uh, discontinued. And NAD didn't go so far as to say it needed to be discontinued, but recommended that the advertiser take caution not to arrive at the same conclusions that NAD recommended be discontinued precisely. The next case is a wireless Sprint Corporation. The challenger was T-Mobile. And this spawned out of Sprint's advertising that it could cut your bills in half if you switched from one of the major carriers to Sprint. Um, it drew a number of its claims. Uh, those that didn't withdraw on the, the uh, cell phone side, NAD said that the explanation of rates was not sufficient in that advertising, and in fact, a 15 to 30 second commercial might not be the right venue for that. But the internet advertising claims were found to be okay because they explained uh, in close proximity uh, to, the, to the claims being made what effect that had on the rates. The only thing that NAD suggested uh, was that See, Sprint needs to make sure that it's an apples-to-apples -apples comparison in that there are various differences 
between the, the Internet network for Sprint and T-Mobile. Uh, for example, T-Mobile has certain apps that will stream content but don't count towards a day cap where that's not the case on Sprint. So uh, NAD made sure that, that if you're going to make a comparison between two dissimilar services, you have to explain that to consumers so it's clear. The next case is Bumpus and Par Warner Leisure Hotels. And I got to tell you, I have never, I'm sure myself and, and Bill McCollin, who's on as well, have never wanted a claim to be more true in our entire lives than the <laughs> advertising claims in this case. This case had to deal with a gin that rejuvenates the skin while you drink. The gin and tonic has been updated to the skin and tonic. Uh, this is a routine monitoring case brought by NAD. The challenger decided not to submit a substantiation for the claim and voluntarily withdrew the claim. The next is Joyous Inc. Again, this is another monitoring case. Chris, you, you skipped over that one too fast. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll bring, bring a sample to, uh, to Vegas for us. Oh, great. Um, so the next case is uh, another routine monitoring case that uh, was Joyous and People magazine. And basically, a People magazine would have a section of the website that says stuff we love because people want to show you all the cool stuff that they love. All the cool stuff that they love was also being sold by Joyous. And that was a, a method of, of sales for Joyous through the website. Now, NAD agreed that the, the videos disclosed that it was a for sale uh, video. You could add things to your cart, so on and so forth. The problem was you, consumers didn't know that until they clicked through. So in other words, the consumers thought that it was editorial content, but we clicked through and saw that it was an advertisement. NAD recommended that that, uh, that be changed. Okay, the next case is Prestige Brands, and the big takeaway from this case is to make sure your studies uh, match the claims that you're being made. Uh, this was an, uh, a claim dealing with odor reduction within, uh, uh, with immediate effectiveness or through three days, but the study that was submitted was measuring effectiveness at three, six, and 12 weeks. Also, it was a home participation study where marketing materials were given to participants before the study transpired so they knew the claims that the marketer was trying to make. Also, only people that were acceptors of the product and that would probably buy the product were in the universe and there was no other control. So uh, mindful when you set up these studies to make sure that they're going to fit the claims that's being made. This case is Bearsdorf. This is a, another routine monitoring case. Uh, it's time for diaper rash cream that would relieve um, diaper rash in six hours. Uh, the interesting thing here is that the claims were withdrawn and Beersdorf tried to get the case closed through Rule 2.2 on the grounds that since they're permanently discontinued, it's not worth the NAD's time and expense. And he said, not so fast. The claim is live when we brought the challenge. It's worth our time and expense. We're going to report this, which is why we're talking about it right now. The case report came out. Okay. A couple here. Um, to Shark Ninja Operating. All right, this is a, a case dealing with a number of uh, comparative superiority claims. The first being uh, Americans now choose Shark 2 to 1 over Dyson. And, it, and despite having a, a disclaimer that said that this claim was based on sales, looking at the overall advertisement, NAD held that this was a consumer preference claim. And in the holding, NAD took an opportunity to explain some of the variables that it considers when evaluating consumer preference claims, including that um, the cost of the product, the accessibility of obtaining the product, certain character, uh, characteristics of the product that distinguish it from its competitors, all these things go into preference claims in consumers' minds. Also, you need to keep in mind that the reality of the marketplace sometimes have a serious effect on opportunity to choose and sale might not necessarily reflect what consumer actually prefers. There's also a no-loss of suction technology claim where Shark said that both the Dyson and the vacuum, or the, the Shark and the Dyson vacuums 
have no loss of suction technology. Now, that uh, Dyson came back and said, no, wait, 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 we offer our no loss of suction technology in a different way that has a benefit. And he said, not so fast. That's not the claim that's being made. The claim that's being made is that both have it and that is okay. Now, last thing I'll mention in this case is a, a water lift demo uh, that NAD found was sub, uh, substantiated, but uh, put in the shark vacuum to show that it, it was, it was uh, powerful and can do this while it was dust loaded while not doing it the Dyson. NAD found that um, uh, that needed to be changed because it implied that the shark would have performed even better. And I see that we're running out of time. I want to leave a couple of minutes if there's any questions or anything like that. We can have a lot to take in. I'm sure people are sort of stunned. Um, um, but if, if folks do have questions, they should feel free to jump in. I um, just want to thank this group for all of this hard work. I um, know how much that work or the last one that they did to get us started on this quarterly series. Um, if we stick with the schedule, the next, uh, in three months, we'll have a presentation from Ed Glenn and his team um, to give us uh, some, some uh, similar what's going on and what you need to know. Um, Bill, is there anything else for the good of the order? I think the order is good, other than we just need to re-remind people that we will have an on-site meeting in at D in Las Vegas, our GA committee meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, September 14th, 4 to 5 p.m. I do not have a room yet, but as soon as that's available, I will shoot around the independent email with the details for that. So we look to see everybody in Las Vegas. All right. With that, we will talk next month. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Take care.